today, whether we're moms, dads, we're grandparents, we're singles, we're teens, we're aunts and uncles, wherever we are, whoever we are, we're going to find a place to rest our hearts and our minds as we remember together that God sees us, he provides for us, he keeps his promises to us, and we are not alone. And we're going to see this <laughs> through the story of a mother named Hagar. Now, if you're familiar with the story of Hagar, you might be thinking, what in the world, right? It's one of those stories that um, I honestly have never liked. I love scripture, love it. But this story, um, if read by a non-believer, sometimes makes you feel like you might need to make excuses for God, right? But I pray that we'll see today the goodness and mercy and provision of our faithful God is all over this true account. So let's jump in and see who Hagar was. Now, Sarah E., Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarah E. said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarah E.'s proposal. So Sarah E., Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. Genesis 16, 1 through 3. Now remember, God had promised Abram and Sarah E. a child of promise in their old age, but they weren't getting any younger, and 10 years had already gone by. Still no child. So Sarah E. decides to take matters into her own hands and force her servant into a surrogate pregnancy. Let's be clear. This is not God's plan at all. God had already promised Abram and Sarah E. a child, right? They were married, so they were one. The Bible is always honest about the poor choices of God's children, and this is one of the worst choices that Abram and Sarah E. could have made. Thankfully, though, God does not define you or I by our worst sins. Culturally, Hagar was a nobody, a slave probably given to Abram and Sarah E. by Pharaoh during their time in Egypt. She had no choice but to go along with this plan. The Bible says that once Hagar became pregnant, she looked at Sarah E. with contempt. And because of this, and perhaps a little jealousy, Sarah E. dealt very harshly with Hagar. So to get away from the abuse, Hagar runs away to certain death in the wilderness. Hagar was pregnant, powerless, and utterly alone in the wilderness. But that's where God met her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah E, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah E, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Oops. <laughs> you, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, for she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Never forget in your darkest moments that God sees you and your circumstances. You know what's cool? Many theologians think that the angel of the Lord in this account is actually God himself. What grace and mercy that God does not only hear her cries of affliction, but this is the first recorded appearance of God appearing to someone face to face. 
Others had dreamt dreams or seen visions. But he amazingly appears to a runaway slave girl. God sees Hagar and gives her the gift of his presence. Hagar is also the first person in scripture to give God a name. El Roy, the God who sees. Moms, single moms, stepmoms, grandmothers who are raising their grandchildren moms. God sees you. He sees the bajillion unseen sacrifices that you make every day. He knows your deepest needs and your desires. He knows your worries and your fears. And he offers you himself. God shows up with his peace and his comfort and his direction. We're going to see that God told Hagar to give her son the name Ishmael. Ishmael means God has heard. Every time she called out her son's name, she would be reminded that the God of the universe stooped down to see and hear her. Spurgeon said of you, you are looked at by God as much as if throughout space there was not another creature but yourself. No matter who you are or what you're facing today, God sees you. And Hagar trusted Elroy, the God who sees, and went back to Abram and Sarah E. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Genesis 16, 15 through 16. Abram names his son what a slave woman tells him to. And for the next, teen, for, next 14 years, Ishmael is Abram's sole heir. Now we see the promise of God originally given to Abram and Sarah E, now called by their new names, Abraham and Sarah, fulfilled, and the true child of promise, Isaac, was born. But let's pick up on the story. On the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. And so she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son. For that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. Genesis 21, 8 through 14. So the true heir, Isaac, was taking his place, and Ishmael and Hagar are no longer needed. At this point, Isaac is about two or three, and Ishmael's about 16. The name Hagar means forsaken, flight, or the one who fears. And this is exactly the circumstance that Hagar finds herself in. Picture this. She's awakened one morning given a packed bag and some water, and told that she and her son are no longer wanted. Forced to flee with her son from the only home he had ever known, Hagar wandered aimlessly in the desert until all of her earthly provisions ran out. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bowshot away, for she thought, I cannot watch that boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift up the boy. Take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. Genesis 21, 15 through 9. 
God mercifully shows up for a second time, and he offers his strength, his provision, and he reminds Hagar of his plan for her son. And she, an Egyptian slave woman, would become the mother of a great nation. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife from him from Egypt. Never forget that God has a plan and he keeps his promises. There's this meme that I love and it says something like, um, behind every great kid is a mom who's pretty sure she's messing it all up. Have you seen that? Don't we feel like that sometimes? So many parents live with this underlying worry and guilt. Am I doing enough? Am I saying enough? Am I praying enough? Are they in the right schools? Are they on the right teams? How are my faults, failures, and brokenness affecting my family? Am I completely messing my kids up? (sighs) Look, God knows that you are the parent that your child needs. God loves our children way more than we have the capacity to love them. And he has had a plan for their lives from before they were born. The scriptures say, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written the days that were formed for me when as yet there were none of them. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Let's look back and let's see what God tells Hagar. Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift up the boy. Take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. God had a plan for Ishmael the whole time. Parents, we have a God-given privilege and responsibility to point our kids to Jesus. But as we lift our children to the Lord, and take them by the hand, God works out his plans in and through them. For every hard and unfair circumstance that Hagar's life had, God turned it for good because he had a plan. And here are just some of the things that redeem this story for me. Hagar was taken from her home in Egypt as a slave, but she was put into a family that knew the Lord Hagar was forced to have a baby for all she knew would become the property of her slave owners. But God gifted her with a son that she was able to raise herself and he would become a great nation. Hagar was abused and fled to the desert. But there she met El Roy, the God who sees face to face. Hagar and her son were kicked out and abandoned given scant provisions for life. But God showed up again and met her needs and guided them towards his plans for their future. The lesson for us is that God provides and we can trust him. We can see God's provision in Hagar's story. When all the world gave her is a packed bag and about four gallons of water, God provided a well in the middle of the desert. And when we find ourselves in a desert of feeling overwhelmed by loneliness, guilt, and shame, El Roy, the God who sees, meets us right where we are with his presence and his provision. The Bible says springs will gush forth in the wilderness and streams will water the wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool and springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. Only Jesus can turn our deserts into life-giving places again. So we have to run to him, fall into his arms, and soak in his presence. Let him fill your heart like a deep well. Come to him and let the living water refresh your souls. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hagar trusted God, 
And he provided his presence, his comfort, his rest, his guidance, and a future. We also have something that Hagar did not have. We have brothers and sisters in Christ. God has provided us this beautiful, messy family of God that prays for one another, encourages one another, bears one another's burdens. It has been said that it takes a village to raise a child. I disagree. I believe it takes a church. And I'm going to shamelessly say a church like Eastridge, a church that has a celebrate recovery, a place where you can be seen and heard and loved and known just exactly the way you are. So no matter what you're facing in life, God loves you. He sees you. He has a plan for you and your family. And he has provided this family of believers to walk alongside you. Trust him. Charles Spurgeon theorized that the well of provision was always there. That God simply opened Hagar's eyes so that she could see it. If Hagar had focused on her circumstances, she and her son would have perished. So what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on your circumstances? Or are you looking for God's provision? How? Are you in the word? Are you in a growth group? Are you in a step study? What are you doing to experience God to the fullest? I want everything God has for me. Don't you? The closer we are to Jesus, the better version of ourselves we become. We become better friends. We become better parents. The best thing we can do for our children is to spend time with the Lord. The best thing that we can do for our marriages is to spend time with the Lord. The best thing we can do for our careers is to spend time with the Lord. The best thing that we can do for ourselves is to spend time with the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you that you are the God who sees. Please help us today to make spending time with you and in your word a priority. We love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Happy Mother's Day, moms. Y'all have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next week. Ha, <laughs>